Cool. So who here uses Condorforge? That's a fair amount of the, of the room. So you basically know what this is already. But for the rest of you who don't know, um, so about me, so I'm Marius. I do data stuff at Flatiron Health. Uh, and I work on Condorforge packaging all kinds of horrible things. So, you know, wh why, wh why, why do we do this, right? So packaging is hard and like modern sort of particularly sort of data heavy applications use an enormously large amount of libraries. Um, and these things change all the time. Uh, and if you wait for you know, Debian stable uh, to get your package, um, I don't know what the version of NumPy on Debian stable is, but I assume it's five or six years old. So that's not great. So you can't actually use or rely on sort of traditional sort of system packagers to package your things for you. So you know, now you have to compile it yourself. That's really hard. So you know, you don't really want to go this alone. So, so Condor Forge is a one-stop shop for every single package that you may care about. So we package everything regardless of platform on Macs, Windows, Linux, no Arch, and in the future, some more other fun things. So the idea is mostly, and we don't, and so Conda, whilst it is written in Python, doesn't just package Python. It packages everything. So you can Conda install Bash, and it works. You know, I believe Anthony added that the other day. So, you know, so for people that have been using it, so some new and interesting events have happened this past sort of cup, this past year or so. So uh, Conda Forge is now a non-focused, fiscally sponsored project. So we, you know, we can now actually afford to pay for CI time. <laughs> so you know, so that's that's pretty great. Uh, so we're part of NumFocus. I don't know why. Okay, and so we have robots now that do a lot of work. So. So the robots have made lots of pull requests. Uh, we have like the majority of, of Python 3.7 completed for building, and we're busy in the in the giant migration cycle where we're sort of recompiling the entirety of the Conda Forge stack. Um, we're about 30% of the way down there. Um, hmm? 40. Or are we about 40? Okay, so. So we're about 40% of the way done, um, but a lot of the really hard stuff is done. Um, there's a What's the compiler switch? So we are using, so we're using the compilers built by, by Anaconda. So there has been, in, in this past year, there's been a, you know, an unfortunate divergence. There's sort of true, two primary Conda channels. Um, there is the default channel maintained by Anaconda Inc. and us. And Previously, you could sort of have these two channels coexist happily, but it hasn't been that great in the past year. So a lot of the things that we're doing now is trying to move to merge the two, these two things back together and maintain sort of stability and parity so that if you want to mix the, mix the channels together, you can and it's not going to break for you. Um, doing this is quite hard and we need to do this very, very carefully. Yeah, so, so more, more specifically, Honda Forge was using GCC 4.8. Um, and then the C ABI changed with GCC 4.5.3, 5.2. And so that broke everything. And so packages compiled, and Anaconda Inc. moved on. And so those packages and Honda Forge no longer play together. So you have to re you literally have to recompile everything. Yeah. And the API compatibility. And the big reason for, for this recompilation re is basically GCC changed how they represent in C++ standard colon colon string. <laughs> and as you imagine, there's lots of C++ code out there that uses a string. And you've basically just broken sort of compatibility with all of that if you, if you mix compilers. So you can't do this. So, and that's a large reason. That's a large reason why, when things like CentOS, CentOS five and six, you can't use packages between them. It's exactly it's, it is exactly the same reason. So, but we're we're getting there. I don't know. It's, so, you know. So, how do you use this? So, if you have Conda installed, 
you basically say conda install dash c conda forge gdel, and that'll install you a gdel. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried to build gdel yourself. Um, it's effectively impossible. Um, <laughs> So GDAL is a geospatial library and it's used heavily by geospatial people. And it is actually a large part of the reason why ContaForge exists. Is, so ContaForge originated out of packaging very hard to build geospatial libraries uh, used heavily by sort of weather prediction people um, in sort of out of the UK Met Office. And now it does everything. And so if you want this as a default way so that you want to just use ContaForge to solve for all the packages. So in your Conda RC, you can add Conda Forge uh, to the channels. Uh, the order here matters. So you probably want it above defaults. So you get things from us first. <laughs> because we have slightly more packages. So what is a package? It's, you know, it's, it's, but you know, I can install stuff with pip. It's like, yeah, you can. I mean. It, it works pretty well, uh, and it works a lot better than it used to, and it keeps getting better, but you know, can you pip install those things? I don't think so. You can totally conda install them, and they work just fine. So the idea is, is that like, conda forge packages a vo extends the packaging sort of space from beyond just these vendor-specific tools, because, um, you know, the the problem is, mo is modern applications are big polyglot things encompassing many languages and using lots of different things all together in concert. And you need a holistic way to be able to install all of that together safely and know that it works. And so far, you know, you can carefully build a Docker container, that'll probably work, or you can use Conda, which effectively does mostly the same thing. So uh, for people that want a fun slide, this is how you do exact reproducibility. So if you care about making a Conda environment and taking it and being able to put that thing down exactly on, the, on another platform. So the first one is uh, that'll give you a canonical thing, but will still, but will still invoke, invoke the solver. The second line there will give you an explicit thing that'll give you a set of packages that are basically just URLs in topological order that will be installed in that sequence. If you do that, then you don't need a Docker file anymore. So you can basically get exact reproducibility of, your, of, of, any, Conda, of any environment installed entirely with Conda. This works really well. Um, and it means you basically have an alternative to something like pipfile.lock but for every single package that is packaged, that is packaged with Conda. This is not just Conda Forge, this is just how Conda works. And alternatively, if you want to turn these into installers, you should probably take a look, look at Conda Pack, um, which is a really, really fantastic piece of technology as well. So, you know, this stuff is great. Um, you know, but you have a bunch of, what if you want to send your own stuff, right? All of us probably have some library that we care about or are maintainers of that we'd like to package and we'd like, you, we'd like it to make it easy for users to use this stuff. So, you know, so basically we have a, we have a, we have a whole bunch of repositories in Conda Forge. There's a repository called Stage Recipes. So you fork the repo, make pull requests, uh, you make the robots happy. Uh, and there's a better, better one here. So firstly, make sure that if the package already exists, you, know, you probably don't need to do something because it exists. So you write a conda recipe. We'll go into a bit of like key components there that matter. Uh, you make a pull request to stage recipes. Um, then, the pool, then the robots kick in, do a bunch of testing. And so one of the big things that, that's interesting about Conda Forge is during this phase here, uh, we have a team of human reviewers that are going to look at this and say, yeah, this is fine. Or we, it's like, this is a really great package. We'd love to have it. But we need like, some minor tweaks to this recipe in order for it to sort of meet the standards of, of packaging in our, in our community. Um, we'd like things to be built you know, fairly nicely, and you know, we have some sort of fairly gentle constraints of like what we accept and won't accept. Um, and then, 
So once, once there's a repository, it gets pushed to anaconda.org, and, you know, and then you, you as a human making, that has made this package can now sort of do maintenance on it, or the robots will do a bunch of work. Um, so, you know, what, so if you want, if you make a conda, conda package, what does that entail? So you basically, you make a meta.yaml file, and I'm gonna, it's like, and these are sort of generally important bits, bits that we care about. So you'll have a build, you'll have a build section that has a build number that'll be zero. You can sort of skip it for things that it doesn't work on. So, you know, say your thing doesn't work on Mac, then, you know, don't build it for Mac. Uh, we're in, we're at Microsoft now, they'll work on Windows, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, this is how you should run pip. If you were at Steve, if you were at Steve Dower's talk, this is how you should run Python things with dash M. So this ensures that your, that, that, that pip will run correctly on Windows and you will run the right pip. Uh, and then there's, there's a bunch of magic args that we don't care about. Um, so because Conda tends to sort of circumvent how pip installs things, we don't actually want pip to solve, we want you to tell us what your thing needs. So your package has requirements. So Conda has sort of three sets of requirements now. It used to be two. So there's been a, been a sort of slight difference in how these things are specified if you, if you haven't done this recently. So uh, Conda used to have two sections called build and run. Um, the section that used to be called build is now basically called host for practical purposes. And there's a new section called build that is basically new. Um, and essentially, so if you have a package, it has a bunch of C dependencies or it has a, it has a C extension, you'll tell, a, you'll tell it, I need to have a compiler around and I need some special compilation tools. That, those sections all go in build. If you, if you have things of, I need to run Python and I need pip and I need like OpenSSL and some weird special thing on Windows because you know, old versions of Windows don't have proper ints for some reason, um, sure. Go add those things, and then my app, my thing requires Python to run, and so these are sort of some of the some of the core components that you would need in your recipe. Uh, we have extensive guides to do this sort of more in depth on Condaforge itself. There's a big example recipe that has like lots of sections and comments on like these are the bits that matter. This is what you should fill in, and also you you should probably take a look at one of the several thousand recipes that we already have. Um, because odds are there's a package that is quite similar to the thing you want to package. Um, and if you want to take a look at how somebody else has done it, uh, you, the wisdom of the crowds is extremely, extremely valuable here. And there's a little extra section there. So that we have is in the, at the very bottom of your, of your recipe you say, there's a recipe maintainer and that's your name. So if you put your GitHub name on there, you basically, when this process happens that we sort of outlined here, you become a maintainer and have commit rights to that repository that sort of spawns from there and you can help sort of keep that thing and keep that recipe up to date and if, if new things, new versions or fancy new features come out, uh, you can do that. So you don't need to wait on anybody else to, to get that done. So, but there's a lot of things that go into maintaining a large ecosystem, right? So, so Conda Forge itself uh, maintains a big set of sort of pins. So I'm just gonna quickly follow this link. Uh, oh God, <laughs> I've lost control of the computer. So, Essentially, we have a set of constraints that we apply. So essentially, we want to build, ignore the very bits at the top. So there's a whole bunch of packages that we've been identifying as things that have, that cause compatibility problems if you sort of just casually change their versions. So basically, you can just say, I require bzip, and we're gonna say, cool, we're gonna use bzip version one. Um, in internally, what, that's, what that means is, we're gonna use Beza version one, and then there's a section up here at the top where we'll say, oh, Beza version one, less than two. Um, so all of that stuff is basically handled for you. 
and you don't actually need to care too much as a package author. Uh, and the whole the whole idea is there is by 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 us evolving this section here, uh, we can affect large scale change on the entire ecosystem of packages that we build, uh, whilst maintaining compatibility across across sort of several thousand packages. Um, it's like getting this right is. You may notice there's a whole bunch of weird stuff here. If you if you are familiar with with how with how sort of selectors work, uh, we're actually using some of this stuff now to as also as sort of migratory flags so that we can selectively opt in into some of these versions for for certain things, um, so that we can sort of gradually and sort of deliberately move an ecosystem forward rather than needing to do sort of big bang kind of upgrades. So, so we do this with a lot of tools. Um, Condor Forge is basically automation uh, on automation. Um, so our primary tool is called Condor Smithy. Um, so that is our tool for building feedstocks. And so that, that tool itself goes and looks at your recipe, goes and look at, looks at the meta.yaml, it goes and looks at a, at a build config that you can place optionally, and it goes and looks at that global pinning configuration, and then it spits out a whole bunch of files that various CI services understand. So it'll spit out a file that Travis CI understands, it'll spit out a file that AppFair understands, one that Circle understands, and very, very soon, one that, one that can be understood by Azure pipelines. Um, so, and then it does this and generates a lot of these sort of support configuration files. So. Um, let me quickly show what one, what one of those looks like. So uh, this feedstock itself is, um, this repository is itself a ConduForge package. Um, and it's got a little, little file here that says, I have these constraints that I, that I get imposed on. And uh, you should not change these things yourself at all. That is a bad idea. But it is useful to look and see is like what is actually going to happen when when I run my when I run my application. So so you know, kind of is a is a very large organization at this point. Um, so we built over one hundred twenty thousand artifacts. Uh, there's about four hundred fifty gigabytes of artifacts. Uh, we have more than 5,000 feedstocks, and every feedstock is a repository on GitHub. Uh, we have over 1,000 maintainers on these, um, and we've made more than 40,000 pull requests. Um, that is a scale that is like complicated. Uh, so dealing with this sort of organizationally in, is, is non-trivial. So, so through this year, we've actually sort of formalized and established actual processes for, you know, Condorforge is a large organization, and we have a core team of about 17 people. Um, and 17, 17 people uh, can very rarely get to any form of sort of unanimous decision approach. Um, it doesn't actually work to get, you know, for consensus is a, is a bad decision strategy when you have more than, I think, <laughs> three people. <laughs> um, so you need a way to make decisions. So we've actually basically worked through a lot of things of like making decisions is important. Um, you may be aware of the fact that Guido van Rossum has sort of stepped down as the PSF. So making decisions, it turns out, is a thing that Python communities are figuring out how to do now. Uh, so we have basically, we've went and established like, look, we need a way to make decisions and we've thought of using these things. And all, our decisions are for the most part public where they can be, certain things are not. Basically, things like inducting new members, votes aren't public. But for a lot of the stuff, you can actually see us vote on issues sort of in public. And you know, once things pass, stuff will typically happen. Um, and we also have a sort of a, a project where people can submit enhancement proposals for how we can do big things better, uh, for sort of like doing large scale changes to the ecosystem. Uh, so we've got a couple of teams. So this is the core team. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people here. Uh, you'll probably see us on GitHub somewhere. 
Uh, we cover a lot of places. Uh, CJs looks weird because reasons. Um, and then we have an additional team uh, that is a superset of, uh, that is mostly a superset of the other one. And the, these are all individuals that will review recipes as they land in the stage recipes. Um, typically, sort of a recipe that's, that lands in stage recipes will sort of review within about like two or three days. Um, and, you know, depending on the complexity, will either land roughly at the same time or require some more, some more fine tuning if it's something complicated. Um, so, we do bots. We believe very, very heavily in automation for everything. So we have three sort of main big bots that do our work. So we have a linter bot, we have the web services bot, and then we have the Condorforge tick bot that we basically put all the rest of the, the functionality into. Um, so, so when you go to Condorforge, so let's go to an actual feedstock. So if I go to Condorforge, staged recipes, uh, I get a pull request, and I open a random pull request of any kind. Sylvain made a thing. Okay, let's go see what Sylvain did. So, so Sylvain, he made a pull request. Um, it's got some code. Uh, he didn't really tell us what it is, but, you know. <laughs> we trust him, right? We trust Sylvain, it's fine. Um, but the bot has done some work. The bot has taken a look at this thing and said, hey, this is, this is a living service. You know, everything's fine. You don't need to worry. And generally, that's what the bot is going to say, um, unless it doesn't, in which case it's probably going to tell you, hey, I found something wrong. Here's how you fix it. Um, so in this case, he's made a recipe. It's got a meta.yaml. Uh, Sorry. Really? Thanks, GitHub. So he's, he's, he has a recipe, and this is basically what every single sort of, re what a lot of basic recipes look like. So you'll see it's the same sort of template pattern. Um, his, thing, his thing is no arch Python, which is a special kind of Python. So it's a Python that, that Conda knows specially how to deal with an install that doesn't actually require us to do a lot of build work. Um, so he needs a modern Python um, and some other things and something like that. Nah. And so, and we we'd like to have we'd like to see licenses and things like that, so that we we do a lot of these things safely. Um, uh, uh, we have the web services spot, so. In a lot of the pull requests, uh, you will see several members of, of our team basically talk to this Condorforge admin and ask it very kindly to, to, to go do things. Um, the bot will then pick up and do the thing that you very kindly asked it to go do. There's a bunch of commands that are, that are, that are listed there. Uh, you can go look up the complete list. The most important ones are basically those two. Um, typically, the only one that we tend to actually use these days is Condorforge is, is please re-render. So if you've made a sort of structural change to your recipe, say, you know, you've realized, oh, I have some compiled code now. I've added a compiler. Um, or I've added one of these things that, that, that exists in the Condorforge pinning. Uh, basically, you need to tell the bot, hey, I made a change. Um, go take care of this for me. And then the bot will basically say, go take a look and see, see if there's work to be done. If there is, it'll make a commit to that, to that feedstock uh, pull request. Um, our bots make commits. Um, we, our bots do not just comment because, you know, I don't want my bot to tell me what work needs to be done. I want it to just do the work. So, and that brings us to the ticker slash rebuild bot. Um, so the ticker bot is, is great. It's like drastically changed, changed my, my workflow in Condorforge. And this is mostly thanks, thanks to CJ, CJ over there. He's done like an incredible job at it. Um, so initially what this, bot was, what this bot is, is you know, when you make a package and you, when you release a new version of your, your thing, you push it to PyPI or some other packaging in, infrastructure, um, you'd like new packages to be built for it. But you don't really want to be bothered with the hassle of like going to Condorforge and say, hey, I released 5.4.2. 
whereas I had 5.4.1 previously. So, you know, let's take the human drudgery out of this. Robots can watch this thing. And, you know, when you release a new package, the robot will say, hey, you released a new package, I think. Let me go make a pull request. And then our various CI will kick in, see if it builds. And if it builds successfully, then you as a maintainer can go hit the green button and say, yeah, this is all cool. Uh, and this all happens all the time. So the bot, the bot has made lots of pull requests at, at this point. Um, it basically runs every hour and does like, you know, and has mostly automated a lot of the general sort of like keeping Condorforge up to date, um, which was sort of historically a bit of a problem where sort of packages that didn't really have sort of maintain very active maintainers that wanted to keep them up to date, um, you know, they didn't. <laughs> So they were sort of languishing. And now we've, we've largely automated a lot of that, that stuff of like, no, the package on Conda Forge is going to be as recent as the version on anything else. That's the idea. Um, and then we're building a lot of fancy other stuff. So, uh, so we're building some things about fancy artifact searching. So we have a full knowledge of every artifact that Conda Forge has ever produced. And we've built indexes for that. So if you, as a user, want to know, I have a thing that's failing because I couldn't find libfoo.so. What the hell gives me libfoo.so? It's like, this is, this, is a, this is a remarkably intractable problem for something that should be simple. Um, and we can tell this now. So we can say, oh, you should install that thing. Um, and then you can, we can also do the inverse now. So Whereas, you, whereas you've specified the requirements that your package needs, um, maybe it's useful for you to know what uses your package. So inverting, this, inverting the dependency graph and saying, you know, so I'm, I'm an author of, of a package. What other things use me? Because it's very interesting to see what the sort of general ecosystem structure is of, you know, of packages that use each other. And you can also you can ask sort of a whole bunch of other sort of interesting sort of global questions about all the packages inside the Conda Forge graph, and you can go find some relatively scary, strange code um, at at regress slash libcflib, which is you know a terrible name. And so we're in the process of adding more build capacity, hopefully a lot more. Um, but sort of for the immediate pain, uh, we're going to sort of try and fix up our FAR queue so it's not really as bad and, and long anymore. And we're working with, uh, with Microsoft um, on getting sort of Azure pipelines sort of ready to roll out for lots of ContaForge so that we can sort of run at a, at a much, much greater scale and have far faster response and feedback for things. And then if any of you were in, in in, uh, in Mike Drottlum's talk, uh, you saw some crazy stuff with WebAssembly. Um, and, you know, Condorforge wants to package that. So uh, it's going to be an interesting challenge, uh, for sure. But there's a, so, so packaging things for, for WebAssembly, um, building things for ARM. Turns out, you know, turns out phones are pretty powerful CPUs these days, and they get put into servers now and they re require no power. So these things are sort of coming into the market as very inexpensive ways to do computing. And then sort of we want to build out a subset of things on sort of PowerPC as well, because supercomputers are still a thing. Uh, and, you know, and so tomorrow, uh, we're going to have a hands-on session uh, where several of the Condorforge core team will be available to sort of help you with some packaging questions or if you just want something packaged, or you just want to hang out and talk to us, um, you know, think of this as sort of like office hours tutorial hour. Um, and we're going to do some sprints on Sunday to make all the stuff even better. Um, so any questions? <laughs> I can just I can just speak. I think it's I think it's loud enough. So very much in the spirit of the last slide with the reverse dependencies and the, the other things that Conda is going to be able to do soon. I've always wanted to keep track of the dependencies versus packages you actually asked for, so that if dependencies change, you can clean up your repo. 
Uh, is that a hidden feature? It's it's that? Is it track? I think it's track. The, the, the cut install. Yeah. I believe that is. I believe that is tracked right now. So, so, so the one thing that you can get is. It didn't used to be. Right. So, um, yeah. So, can you do a clean? Not, not, not the kind of clean where it removes cash, but can you say remove anything else that? Re I remove see? things that I didn't explicitly ask for, something like that. Dependencies no longer. Um, I mean, it, it's going to move your dependencies to ensure compatibility, but so so. Yeah. Okay, but it could. But it could, right? Okay. So. Yeah. So. Right, but I have a long running environment. I don't want to. You know, there's a, there's a conda history in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You should probably treat your environments as deeply disposable and throw them away when they're no longer useful. No, that's true. That's true. No, no, no. I, I understand. No, I like to explain why you're not doing it because it's absolutely true. Okay. Like, what's the real problem? Really so, problem? what packaging managers do, like every packaging manager does this, has this feature. If you're talking about like Linux packaging manager or PSD or whatever, they all keep track of. Package you actually want. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. And, and then you can say, dependencies change, you can say, you know, clean up. And it removes packages that you don't want. Fair enough. So that's, that's not the once it's tracked, it will be easy to. Yeah, the, the, the solver right now um, does actually remove packages from the installation if they're no longer required. Like, that is actually in already doesn't happen that much in, in the current case because it sort of it takes the current set of packages that you have as the state that it wants that, that, it, that it wants to keep. Um, so yeah. basically if you tell it you have an initial if you tell it you have a different initial state than it, what it actually has, um, then it will actually remove things but right now it's not quite there. So, is it exactly my use case? Because my work machine is on Windows, so I pretend that that is my operating system inside the common environment. And plus, I'm following Anthony's advice about uh, <laughs> the talk from yesterday. We have another question, actually. Maybe yeah. cool. we'll move on, and you guys can continue yeah. this afterwards, maybe. No, I don't oh, what? Okay. I got okay. Go for it. Yeah, so I know with, I don't know if this is on. Oh, well. It, okay, either way. Um, so I know with uh, some package distributions, like if you want to like recreate a particular environment, you can make like a Debian distro and have your own distribution, pulls everything in so you can recreate your same environment, but your actual package is empty. It just lists a whole bunch of dependencies. And sometimes people do that same thing with like uh, requirements.txts. Uh, is that a common usage that you see with like Conda Forge where somebody would define their own a uh, particular package that's just for their environment and ends up not really requiring any source code because it's strictly used for dependencies. And is that something you think would work good in a workflow? Um, so as for so, Condorforge, <coughs> so Condorforge uses meta packages, which is basically that sort of idea of you have a package that only that only sort of specifies runtime requirements um, or sort of runtime constraints and can, can enforce those. Uh, we use those fairly selectively for things. Um, so I can definitely see that there's value in a service like that. Um, that's probably Condorforge adjacent. Um, as for hosting those, those packages inside Condorforge itself, there are some problems with that. Um. <laughs> there is exactly, to the best of my knowledge, there's exactly one of those. Yeah. And I think I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to we make, haven't actually used it that much, though. It it is an interesting use case, and like I can definitely see that see that there is a model where you have you know a, a smaller sort of like org level side repository that has like I need these things, and here are the channels I care about. Um, that kind of that kind of model, um, you can do that and set that up yourself very very easily. Um, as for Condorforge hosting that for you, probably no. But like, sort of a side thing that that lives not in the Condorforge primary channel, 
that's quite feasible. Any more questions? Uh, probably just very naive one. I never done that before, and I have a package that is heavily dependent on C, which I'm not super familiar with. To be honest, uh, anyway, long story. Uh, how would I try to make a dry uh, dry run first instead of you know PRing you? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I would honestly recommend you make a PR. Uh, like uh, so, we have we have automation that will build it for you in a whole bunch of environments that you don't necessarily have access to. Um, I don't know if you have an OS X and a Windows and a Linux machine available. Uh, most people don't, so it's probably just actually a good idea to just make the PR. If it fails, it's fine. Um, like you know, PRs like that's what CI is for, right? CI is there to fail, so that you know about this. Um, so I would, I would honestly say, it's like, if you have a sort of scary C, C kind of thing, go look at like some of our sort of fairly, fairly big C packages. So you know, if it's something sort of big and complicated, find something similar. If it's something sort of basic, like you know, like Bash, Bash is simple. So it's like it's got a basically effectively calls a dot dot forward slash configure make make install, um, and a lot of the stuff is like that. Um, and you can basically find a recipe that sort of matches that kind of structure. You can come tomorrow and talk. You can come tomorrow and we can help you as well. <laughs> Shall we call it a day? Yep. yep. Thanks. 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 Oh.